Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 60. Thanks so much for joining us. I wasn't sure if people would be watching live today because the first and possibly only presidential debate is going on right now, but it looks like we have some people here. So hello, everybody. A um, bunch of viewers on YouTube. We have a bunch of viewers on Facebook. Um, say hello, and I'll shout out your name. Um, you can use the chat window throughout the show to... Um, answer que or ask questions for Kathleen McClung, today's guest. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication for since 1995. That's 25 years, and we are unaffiliated with any other organization. If you uh, enjoy what we do, please do click the like button no matter where you're watching this, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Periscope. Um, the like button really helps. Also, make sure that you're subscribed. Um, yeah, Richard Westheimer's here. That's CB99 Videos. Hey, good to see you. Barbara Lutz, nice to see you too. Yeah, we got a nice crowd already, so that's good to see. So please do make sure you're subscribed and uh, you click the like button. And we're going to skip the warm-up poem tonight. Because um, today's guest, um, Kathleen McClung, has a um, class she teaches at 7. So we have a little bit less time than we normally do, just by like 10 minutes. Usually we can bump over, but this time we can't. So I want to make sure that we get to as much um, of Kathleen as we can. Now, as everybody watching probably knows, Kathleen was the winner of the 2020 Rattle Chapbook Prize, one of the three winners, and um, the first book that we published in that series, um, A Juror Must Fold In On Herself, uh, which all subscribers have already read, so uh, I'm sure you have questions. And don't forget to leave them in the chat window. She's also the author of Temporary Kin, The Typists Play Monopoly, and Almost the Rowboat. She's been uh, a, um, a Pushcat Prize and Best of the Net nominee. She's winner of the Rita Dove, Morton Marr, Shirley McClure, and Maria W. Faust National Poetry Prizes. Um, her work appears all over the place. She's a great formalist poet, as you know, because you've read the chapbook already. And um, here she is, Kathleen McClung. Hey, Kathleen, how you doing? I'm terrific. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'd rather be here than watching the debates, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, me too. These are the highlights of my week, and it doesn't change even if the fate of the you know, Western civilization hangs in the brink <laughs> on some other Truly. channel. It doesn't matter. I'd still rather be here. So. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Um, do you want to start out with a poem? I don't know what... Um, Sure. What you want to start with, but but I have four books here, so whatever you want to read, it'd be you know, great. I thought I thought what I'd do is um, read several poems from the the winning chapbook, and um, I thought I would start with the very first juror poem that I wrote um, about about two years ago, and this poem um, I sent to uh, Kim Bridgeford, the brilliant editor of Mezzo Chemin. She loved it, she published it, and that gave me the kind of courage to continue writing jury poems. Hmm. So um, I'm sending this out to the memory of Kim Bridgeford for publishing this very first poem. Um, this is called The Juror's Lament, and it's a rondeau in three parts. And it's on page 20, oh, thank if you're you. following along. The Juror's Lament. Number one, box. We must not speak, return to scene of crime, bleak dive bar street, or worse, research online the cast of players in this cheerless room. Plump sneaker judge instructing us, assume no guilt for now. She looks like Gertrude Stein. Stern prosecutor, watchful like a mime. Public defender, sleek in Calvin Klein, accused at table, silent as a tomb. We must not speak, but pay 15 to park, arrive at nine, inch through antique metal detector line, and take our seats inside this box, resume our stony faces, doused in dull perfume of civic duty, steno pads. Confined, we must not speak. Two, locked hallway. A smaller room awaits us twelve who wordlessly observe from swivel chairs. We heard this case, 
murky surveillance video, paid expert witnesses who swore they know who did it, how, and why. So much has blurred these weeks within our box. We have endured the bloody photographs, the vague, absurd insinuations. Now it's time to go. A smaller room will house our conversation long deferred while lawyers spun their tales of what occurred in winter, 803, four years ago. We shuffle down a hall, reluctant row of citizens. If we convict, he is assured a smaller room. Three, verdict. I print guilty with ballpoint pen and sign my name. Below, I add the date and time from Melvin's phone, 11.43. We've made our peace. We wrestled mightily for days, the bailiff locking us at nine, the grim defendant on hall bench, a signed or self-imposed vigil as anodyne. His presence brought us no tranquility. I print guilty, relieved to finish, stand and leave behind the awful pad marked juror six, blue lines, thin horizontal bars, a penitentiary. Success are reaching unanimity? Perhaps the punishment our judge defines. I print guilty. And so that was um, The Juror's Lament from Kathleen's newest chapbook, which just came out for all subscribers to rattle. And if you haven't, if you don't subscribe yet, you can subscribe right now and get it in the mail too, along with our fall issue, A Juror Must Fold In On Herself. Um, Kathleen, I've been wondering since I read this chapbook for the first time, like in like December or whenever, how much of this is based on a true story? I, I assumed it was inspired by actual an actual jury duty um, yes, that you had. Yes, yes, it it, it definitely uh, grew out of a case that I was a forewoman for. Um, the case was a couple of years ago. It was a vehicular manslaughter case in which a child was killed. Um, and so quite a few of the poems, you know, really do focus on what it was like to be part of that particular jury. Um, there are some poems in the chapbook, however, that are not um, based on my experience. All of the sequestered juror poems um, are inventions. Uh -huh. um, I got to thinking while I was working on the other poems, you know, I thought my experience was stressful. What would it be like to be, you know, sequestered away from family, from friends, stuck in a hotel? You can't, you know, talk to your family, you can't talk to your friends. And I just thought, I'm going to explore what that would feel like. So I wrote a series of, of poems from the sequestered jurors mm -hmm. point of view. And that's that's definitely imagined. Definitely. I was not sequestered. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do research on what it what it's like to be sequestered? Because that's something that I've um, never experienced. I definitely, or... Well, I, I definitely researched juror stress because mm -hmm. I found my experience so stressful that, you know, I went online and wanted to find out, you know, is this just me or do a lot of jurors find this very, very stressful? And yes, I found out that the longer the case goes, the higher the stress um, and I, to, to research the sequestered juror poems, I, I basically read a little bit about the O.J. Simpson jurors. Um, they were sequestered for nearly a year. Wow. And I just thought, that would be torture. That would just be torture. <laughs> so that was pretty much the only research I did was kind of general juror stress research and then a little bit about the O.J. jurors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just I love jury duty, actually. Um, I don't know if it's your is this your only time being on a jury? Um, yes, I was selected for one before, but then they settled out of case uh, out of trial. Um, and so this was my first experience. Tell me what you loved about <laughs> your jury duty. I'm <laughs> did, did you love it, too? I mean, I, I felt like, it was, well, it was fascinating. It was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, earlier in my life, I thought I might want to be a lawyer. And so from a lot of levels, I found it a really fascinating experience. Um, what was what was so <laughs> cool about it for you? Well, for me, I felt like it restored my faith in humanity, kind of, because um, um, I've been on the jury twice. And one was a really quick trial for a flasher. There was really nothing to it. But the other one was um, for a um, black prostitute. Um, who was clearly actually a prostitute, who was clearly also entrapped um, by the mm. police officer. And mm. it was down in, in the high desert of um, San Bernardino County here. And, um, and, I, and, and all the uh, people on the jury but me were, were very clearly like older, white, conservative mm. um, mm-hmm. Republicans who, uh, you know, like Christians who like, the idea of prostitutes, you know, and then it's mm-hmm. a black prostitute. And mm-hmm. I thought for sure that I would be like the, the last man on the 12 angry men or whatever, being like, no, like the cops set her up. It's not true. And the whole case, as I presented all the evidence, I was thinking about, um, you know, how to make my stand, you know. Uh-huh. And then we go into the deliberation and everybody, one after another, completely agreed that it was entrapment and she's not guilty. And it took like, like, 15 minutes maybe to deliberate oh. there were no holdouts even uh-huh. um it was just it was and so um you know the, and everybody just takes it so seriously like there's sort of a way yeah. that so much of our interactions are like online and sort of half serious in a weird way these uh-huh. days and and uh-huh. so when you're like confronted with a serious thing like this is someone's life like in the balance and then yes. seeing everybody take it seriously is just so cool and um yes. it's such a restoration of our f- of faith in the way the world works that both times uh-huh. it's been like that and i've loved it both times uh-huh well i agree with you i took it very very seriously and so did the other members of our jury and um you know we were told early on by the judge that you know if it if we didn't have the jury system decisions would just be made by judges and, and, and she said, and, and maybe professional jurors. And I just thought, what? So, um, so I thought, this is my civic duty, um, and I want to step up. And um, uh, I, I did notice during the selection process of our particular jury that the lawyers were sort of dismissing a lot of the women um, potential jurors. And I leaned over to someone next to me, and I said, they're getting rid of all the women. And, and I just sort of felt like it, it's not just my civic duty, but it's sort of my feminist duty to, you know, serve on this jury. And, um, you know, I was selected. And, and I have to say, I say this in one of the poems, I was a little bit flattered that, oh, they, they picked me. They, they thought that I would be fair and even handed and listen well and, you know, do all the things I try to teach my students how to do. So, you know, there was that, too. But, yeah, I, I can see, you know, how it would for you be you know, a really enjoyable process. <laughs> um, uh, over here on the on the chat window, Karen Davidson says something. She, she says, um, it's interesting how we're all experiencing a version of sequestration these days. Yes, um, I found yes. being a juror exasperating. Reason did not prevail. I guess I was lucky, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm two for two, I guess, with good, good juries to work with. <laughs> but um, yeah. You know, yeah. A, a big reason I, I stepped forward to, to serve as the jury for woman was I thought the the worst possible scenario would be to get back into that deliberation room and just have chaos, you know, just have people yelling at each other and interrupting and, and all that. And I just thought, you know, I've been a teacher for about 30 years. I have some skills keeping people, you know, focused and on track and we'll have a, a you know, a discussion. Our deliberation lasted a couple of days and you know the only ground rule i set was let's just not interrupt each other let's just listen to each other and we may not all agree but let's just hear each other out so mm-hmm. yeah. um, do you want to read another poem from the book sure i think i'll read the poem on page 12 called superior court guzzle A list of required questions, like an eye chart, hangs over the lawyer's shoulders. I answer dutifully, can't quite get over two men in gray suits gazing back at me, the exact same expression sculpted over their faces, inquisitive and blank. They're almost twins. 
Later, each will smile strategically, stroll over to our box to hammer home some point, place a hand, cufflink, wristwatch, but no ring, over the narrow wood railing that pens us in. The tall prosecutor in particular casts a spell over me, not the kind on Sinatra records, more like he probably Googles us, assigns his staff to pore over our profiles, tailors his closing argument by quoting novelists we know. Okay, so I may be overthinking here, but that's what goes on in our little box. We can't talk, so we think about everything over and over. The mother's testimony, the parade of experts, the cops, one with a cane, he hooks over the narrow wood railing that pens him in. And when the prosecutor takes aim at Goliath, whose shadow looms over the room, he has my full attention. I almost grip that slingshot, hear the stone whiz over our heads. But no, I freeze neutrality on my face, ache to frown or weep. Later, I will. When this trial is over at last, I will rip that eye chart off the wall, shred it into confetti, stomp on the pieces over and over. <laughs> yeah. You know, all the poems in this book are um, a nice FBI mug. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. More FBI, less Trump. <laughs> um, so, so you know, all the other poems in this book are, are formal, and um, your other books too. I have four of your books here, and and they're all, I think, um, forms of some kind. I didn't notice. I sort of read through most of the most of the poems and most of the books. I don't think I noticed any poems that are not formal. Uh, maybe I'm missing some, but um, but but how did you um, start writing writing formal poetry? Is the is the way you write, and and why? Hmm. Mm. That's a really good question. When did I start? Um, you know, I've been a teacher, as I said, for going on 30 years, and I've taught all kinds of literature classes and all kinds of poetry classes. And, um, you know, I, I can remember teaching Elizabeth Bishop's Sestina, which is maybe my favorite poem ever. And I thought to myself, I want to try this. I want to see if I can do what Elizabeth Bishop does. And so I started to write my first Sestina and I loved it. I just loved the challenge, the, the building of this really complicated poem. And, um, you know, not much on, you know, puzzles, but it feels like working a puzzle to, to write a Sestina. And I just like, I just like a good challenge. And, and so I can remember that was kind of the turning point when I began writing Sestinas. And I've, I've said to other people that I find form very comforting. To write in form gives me an opportunity to often to explore, you know, feelings that are just really kind of chaotic or difficult or swirling around. And if I have a form, I, I've sort of talked in terms of it's sort of like it's like getting into a little vessel. I think of a form like, say, a sonnet, like kind of like a little canoe. And I get into that canoe and I can sort of paddle in my canoe across sometimes, you know, really painful or difficult or confusing material. And, and I find the, the, the vessel to be, to be comforting, to be a way to travel, um, in, in rough waters, I guess. So. Um, I, I'm a judge for a contest. I judge the sonnet category of the Soul Making Keats contest. I love seeing what people do with sonnets. Um, and I, you know, the sonnet is really malleable. You know, there's the traditional sonnet, but then there's all sorts of experimental sonnets. So I just form just, there's just a lot, a lot of malleability in form. And, um, so I don't, I don't know beyond that. Those are some of the things that come to mind when I think of why. I, I write in form. Um, I, I do find it sort of harder to write a free verse poem just because it's just like so much. How to how to like shape it? So form gives me a way into shaping 
often really complex emotions. Yeah, what's that 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 phrase that like um, the paralysis of choice? Is that the yeah. right phrase? Like that's kind yeah, of how free verse is. It's the definitely yeah. too many options maybe. Too many options. Give me <laughs> like two or three or four or six. Like in a Sestina, six words. I can work with those six words. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Sestinas are probably my least favorite form. And every once in a while, there's a I, great yeah, Sestina. I, uh -huh. I don't know. It feels, I guess it feels kind of like arbitrary usually. Like it, it, it sort of doesn't add anything. Then every once in a while, there's a Sestina, like in, including yours, where um, it feels like there's a, like it adds something like the, the repetition. I'm not sure what it is. Like the repetition means something and sort of somehow enhances the, mm -hmm. the way the poem feels. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for writing Sestinas? I, it's probably, I would say just, just based on the number of, of Sestinas that I personally feel work versus don't, uh, it might be the hardest form. Um, how do you like go about a Sestina? Well, well, I teach Sestina in, in my, um, my poetry classes. And you know, before, one before of the... you go and I should just explain everybody, Sestina is, um, it's a six stanza or six line stanzas and the same word ends each of the six lines with a, um, um, and then there's a certain pattern that they, they sort of reproduce oh. themselves as you go. And then in the oh. very last stanza is three lines with oh. um, all six of those words in the three lines, basically, just in case, in case people don't know what a Sistina is. But, but continue, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no worries. Um, what, one of the first things I say is pick six words that you can do a lot with. Um, and typically words, like say the word, you know, one, O O N E. It can also be W O N, et, et cetera. So I, I advise people to pick six words that can be kind of manipulated rather than like rhinoceros. If you're stuck with rhinoceros, you got to have like rhinoceros <laughs> in every single stanza. So that would be my first advice: is just select six words that you can that you can really play with that give you a lot of latitude. And um, I, it, it's hard to to write a narrative in a sestina. Um, so I, I don't necessarily advise, you know, tell a story in your sestina, but, but definitely sestinas have this sort of obsessive quality. So if there's some sort of subject matter that, you know, feels, you know, uh, like it's weighing on you and it's just, it's just continuing to haunt you, that might be good subject matter for a sestina. Um, and I just advise people, you know, experiment and play and, um, it, it is a challenge and just kind of rise to the challenge and not, it's not for everybody. You know, I, I hear it's, you know, it's hard and it's, it can be, it can end up sounding really wooden. Uh, another piece of advice is enjambment. Don't end your lines at the end of the line, carry over and jam and jam that helps keep the 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 rhythm and the the flow so that it doesn't have that clunky feel to it so um and i just have people read some really really good sestinas and get a sense of you know the elizabeth bishop one that i mentioned for example just just haunts me um so so those would be the main pieces of advice yeah and uh, and I'd love to read the Sestina in my book, if I may. Yeah, I was about to say, um, yeah, I think that that calls for it. So please go ahead and um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, read that. Okay. Um, it's on page 17. The sequestered juror writes a Sestina. Luckily, you knit. You finished the first sleeve yesterday. Wool almost as soft as Alegria's fur, rose red. No needles allowed in the metal detector. You take them into court only in your mind and yarn. Now here, your clicking's a jig in this pub of one, this room overlooking someone's Mercedes, main plates a long way from home. What distance to a verdict, long or unbearable? The OJ jury in custody 265 days. You remember white Ford Bronco, tight black glove. No one forgets. Then quarters plinked in yellow boxes and you read testimony in narrow columns of print every morning. 
Now you are forbidden from reading, forbidden from any talk of this trial. For good measure, all your talk, your mail, monitored. A deputy sits in the long corridor, plays video games, his yes audible every now and then. You have begun counting nights and days the way you count cars, eight blue, three red, six silver, or words per line, nine plus one extra here and there. You see yourself as someone who will be a champion deliberator, someone who will take her time, weigh evidence on a sturdy scale, reread notes in her steno pad aloud, only humor long-winded men for a little while, not all day. But you're nowhere near that conference table yet. Now you have an armada of pillows, coffee from pods. Now you knit a sleeve. Remember, the dream team won. OJ went free. Imagine the 12 that October Monday. Imagine their exhaustion. They're bursting like volcanoes to talk at last, lift their voices again after so long. Did they get drunk after their verdict was read? Did they leave car keys with valets and red jackets, dance like dervishes, spinning in dark nightclubs now defunct? Or did they instead embark on impossibly long hikes in the San Gabriels, looking for the one sacred hawk or wolf, or moth that would take everything, carry everything away. You finished a sleeve yesterday, a small one, rose red, for a newborn. More must take shape from your long skeins, your clicks. From these sequestered days, you are counting, counting now. Excellent. And that was the Sestina. Um... It was the sequestered juror writes Sistina. There are a bunch of sequestered juror poems. Um, before we move on, um, Emilio Porta, who I think is a fan of Sistina's maybe, because he has a lot of exclamation points in his comments, um, he asked if you could explain the take and talk switches, and how long do you advise the lines in a Sistina to be? Oh, well, I always kind of, I'm sort of um, a liberal in the sense of, take and talk, they're close enough, they count. So when I'm teaching Sestina writing, I encourage people, you know, if it's close enough, go for it. There's there's no Sestina police that are gonna come and say, you know, it's not the exact word. So, um, so I just feel, um, take liberties, stretch the word a little bit. Um, and the other question, remind me what uh, about, that other- About line length? Like how long the line should be? Um, you know, I, the, if a line gets too long, the Sestina feels really bulky and really, really like a long thing. So, you know, I, I, I am a pentameter, you know, aim for 10 syllables. Um, and, you know, I, w- I would sort of keep it a medium length. And if you can do a good Sestina with really short lines, I say go for it. Huh. I would say if you're going to err on the side, err on the side of brevity rather than like long, long, long lines. Those, those Sestinas can be really sort of deadly when they're long lines. That's it, a great question. It's, it's really interesting question. that you say that because I've noticed over the years just reading submissions that a lot of times the Sestinas have this sort of shape like a boot or something where the the <laughs> lines get a little longer and longer every time and then yeah. by the end they're like too long for the page even i think that's yeah. a sort of a a, a tr- sustained trait that maybe to to watch out for yes totally yeah 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 watch out for that one that's a great question <laughs> um you know i i wonder sort of where you came from as a poet um have you been writing poetry like your whole life or, or how did yes. you yes. turn yes. you know how did you turn on to poetry well, um, I've been writing in all forms since, you know, elementary school. I can remember, you know, first grade, little haiku. And high school, I did a lot of um, journalism. I did, I, I was on the debate team. Um, I did drama. I wrote poetry. I just wrote, wrote, wrote. And in college, I started getting serious about poetry. 
I took several poetry workshops with Alan Shapiro hmm. and he, he introduced us all to form. And I wouldn't say that that's when, you know, form grabbed me, but I, I started to see, okay, you can do a lot with form. Um, and then I went to grad school in my late twenties and studied with Philip Levine and um, Peter Everwine at Fresno State and, you know, took a lot of poetry courses from them. And again, was introduced to all kinds of poetry, um, um, form and free verse. And Philip Levine definitely focuses on writing about work. And that's really stayed with me. Mm -hmm. I write a lot about people working. And someone pointed out to me that, you know, my book has the word juror in it. Another of my book has the word typist in it. So, you know, I've got these sort of working figures. And I, I that was probably Philip Levine's mm -hmm. influence. Um, and, and then I, I was really quiet as a writer in much of my thirties. I was trying to make a living. I was working as an editor, um, as a teacher. And I think it was after I got laid off from a job during the recession hmm. that I said to myself, okay, now's the time, you know, get serious about your writing career. And I was in my late forties at that time. And so I returned to, to writing and, and really started focusing very seriously on poetry in, in my late 40s. And so all of my books have been published in my 50s. And, and I do have to say, I turned 60 in May, and I'm so delighted to be on the Rattlecast number 60. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my birthday was very quiet because of, you know, the pandemic. I didn't have a big, you know, big party. But um, winning the Rattle Prize and having this, this book published through Rattle has has been, you know, probably the best thing that's happened during the pandemic. So thank you for having me on Rattlecast number 60. <laughs> oh, that, that's so great to hear. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's cool kind of now, like you talked about, um, you know, starting sort of launching your career. And that's where I noticed that, that it sort of took off with books and stuff, you know, in that era, like 12 years ago during the recession. And now people have an opportunity in the same kind of sad way with the with the pandemic um, but you also mentioned um, Alan Shapiro, who I've never never said this on the show, but I think Alan Shapiro might be my favorite poet. Um, and really? People don't talk about oh. him much, but I oh. I love it. like his book Song yeah. and Dance is probably my yes. it might be my favorite book. If you had to like make me pick yeah. a book, I might wow. pick Song and Dance. And tell us why? Why do you love him? Um, I love just the way he plays, maybe with like syntax. Like there's a music to the way he stretches and like weaves sentences that just it's just amazing to read out loud. Like if, like if I am trying to explain to somebody how important it is to like, like sentence structure itself, like Alan Shapiro is like the best at that. Um, mm -hmm. Like he has these things that just weave so intricately. It, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And then he has, you know, like all great poets, he has heart to it as well as like the music. And it's just, yeah. it's about real yeah. life. Um, yeah. So I just yeah. love Alan Shapiro. Is there something yeah. that like you took away from his classes? I, I don't think I've met anybody who took any one of his classes before. Well, when, when I studied with him, he was very young. Hmm. Um, you know, he was a Stegner fellow. And um, once you finish your Stegner fellowships at Stanford, you stay on as a Jones lecturer. And I think that's he was a Jones lecturer when I studied with him. I, you know, here I was 19 and 20 and he was probably 27 hmm. or something. So uh, what, you know, I, I just remember um, thinking here is this young poet who who loved poetry and was extremely articulate talking about why he loved poetry and um he had a great sense of humor <laughs> and I, you know i poets can sometimes take ourselves pretty seriously i know i take myself pretty seriously and and he just made us laugh a lot around that conference table and um i've followed his career i've i've bought every book of his that has come out he's published like nine or ten and at AWP this past spring, there was going to be a tribute to Alan Shapiro, but because so much of AWP got canceled because of the coronavirus, they've rescheduled it. So you, we can all tune in to a tribute to Alan Shapiro in um, the AWP of 2021. Um, and I, I hope to someday, you know, meet up with him again. I haven't seen him since I was about 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, the other thing that, that Alan Shapiro did is he introduced me to um, the Elizabeth Bishop quote, which I think is one of the best quotes uh, about art and poetry, which is that that what we want from art um, is the same thing necessary for its creation. 
And that is a self-forgetful, perfectly useless concentration. And, uh -huh. and that was something that Elizabeth Bishop wrote in um, one of her letters to a friend, I think. And he mm. pulled that out and sort of mm. highlighted it. And I think that's completely true. And, you mm. know, talking to you as a formal poet, I always feel like formal poets, um, you know, the form is the way to get to that self-forgetful state where you can have that uh -huh. sort of perfectly useless concentration that, that's the uh -huh. meditation that, that makes yes. real art. Um, yes, yes, yes. Mm, mm, mm. So well said. I can't say it any better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me neither. I mean, <laughs> like like Elizabeth Bishop did it, and that's sort of all you need to know, yeah. really, about yeah. art. Really, um, really. Do you want to read another poem um, from maybe a different book, or I don't know what you sure, want to do, sure. but we're free um, and open sure. for about twenty minutes. We have left. Okay. Um, yeah, I I think what I'd like to do is read one or two poems from my book Temporary Kin. Um, you know, this this year has been just the most difficult year for everyone on the planet and um and i i have to say that um i've been really lucky to have two books published in 2020 um a juror must fold in on herself and temporary kin came out from barefoot muse press um in january and um so i think what i'll do is read uh a poem on page 26 um this is a villanelle and um, you don't really need to know much. It's it's a, a San Francisco poem, um, and it 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 was written way before the pandemic. But I think it it's partly capturing the, the feel of our times. It's called "For the Young Man Unimpressed with the Sky." It's just the moon. He shrugs, blasé. This teen. His mother, stirred like me, does not agree. We strangers gaze, transfixed. The light turns green as we step off the curb and walk between these yellow lines. Familiar mystery. It's just the moon, of course, but full. We've seen its sliver in the sky, known its routine each month, a moving toward immensity. We strangers gaze in awe. The light turns green. Sixth Avenue seems safe to cross if screens are off in every car. No guarantee. It's just the moon, just solstice. No machine that waits for us to cross can ever mean what full moon in a winter sky does. Constancy. We strangers gaze grateful for light, for green, for seasons, cycles, wheels that spin unseen far longer than our brief mortality. It's just the moon. You're right. You're 17. We strangers praise it, though. The light turns green. And that was for the young man unimpressed with the sky. Great title. And a great title to this book, too. I love that idea, Temporary Kin, which sort of echoes through the book. Um, the idea that we're sort of all, you know, everybody that we encounter maybe is temporary kin. Um, and that maybe ties into Amy Miller is here. I, I don't know if you know Amy Miller. Absolutely. Hello, Amy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should have her on the podcast, actually. She's a great yes, poet. We published her a bunch. Yes. I'm going to email her after the show and yes. ask her to be on soon. But um, but she asked, would you talk a bit more about the poetry of work? I feel like it leans toward manual labor, and I'm always interested in poems about office work, but that seems fairly rare. And I was going to ask you the same kind of question, um, but then sort of got sidetracked with, I think, Alan Shapiro. But uh, but yeah, so so can you talk a bit about the poetry of work? Uh, uh, what I can say with regard to Temporary Kin is um, I wrote a sequence of sonnets set at drive-in movie theaters um, because, A, I loved going to drive-ins. As a kid, my, my parents would take my sister and me to drive-in movies, and I just, we just loved that. And, and then as a teenager, I would go with my friends. And, um, and I, I, I got fascinated with what is it like to work at a drive-in movie, you know, to be in the ticket booth or behind the candy counter or in the projection booth. And, and I just... I tend to write a lot of poems kind of wondering what would it be like to be, you know, the projectionist at a drive-in movie. And so uh, when I write 
poems about work. It's, it's sometimes work I've done or people I know have done. Other times it's, it's me just sort of curious about the texture of life while that work is happening. Um, because so much of our days are spent at the workplace. You know, if you think about it, 40 hours a week, um, you know, before the shutdown, we were going to an office or going to, a you know, a supermarket or wherever it is that we worked. And so, so much of how we define who we are comes through our work. And so for me, I just think that there's just endless room to explore work in poetry. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think what other poems. I've written about work as a teacher. Um, I wrote a poem about giving final exams to my night school students over and over and over again. And, you know, just the sort of the, the repetitive things we do in the workplace, the, the, the injustices we experience in the workplace. There's just so much, so much territory to explore in work poems. So that's a great question about work. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I think, um, you know, work connects with so many people. It's, it's interesting to hear the, you know, the jobs people do and to think about that. Um, mm. So, so Barbara Lutz says, I appreciate a poet who reads well. Thank you. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Do, you, do you have any, um, that's the first time we've had a comment like that in a while. Um, do you have any sort of advice or how do you go about reading a poem for the public? Um, I know for, for, for me, I read much too fast. Like my, I have to very consciously try to slow on this podcast, my voice down. Cause I, I tend to just like, you know, just go, go, go. And, um, when I'm reading, I try not to do that, but I end up falling into it anyway, very often. But, but what do you, how do you con conceive of how to present a poem, um, over audio? And, and what do you think about that? Well, um, this is probably the the longest audio um, you know reading I've done, and I'm enjoying it immensely. And I'm glad to know it's coming across well. Uh, I've I've been reading out loud since you know childhood and teenage years. I did a lot of, as I said, competitive debate and theater and, and all that as a teen. And as a teacher, I've had to read poetry out loud to my students, you know, for the last thirty years. And um, for some students, it's Poetry is a tough sell, you know, if they're, poetry is hard and, you know, boring and some of the things that, that students will say. So I've just found it, it's in their best interest and my best interest to, to read a poem as, you know, um, arrestingly as possible. And, um, you know, yeah, I just would say for people um, when you're preparing for a reading, you know, um, practice in advance, uh, slow down, people do tend to rush and, um, um, you know, try to give a little bit of, a little bit of intro to a poem. I've been to readings where people just go on and on and on and on giving, you know, paragraphs of background for a, a tiny little, you know, haiku or a tiny little poem. And so there's this fine art of knowing just enough mm -hmm say just enough and not you know beat a dead horse so you know there's there's different classes that you can take and and just kind of kind of watch the, the poets who's who are giving good presentations and sort of study what what is it that they do and a lot of it is just lots of years of practice <laughs> <laughs> really yeah i think that um that that talking between the poem is so important too because it sort of lets you like de like, like there's a heightened speech that a poem is and it's like kind of intense. And so just mm -hmm. even, like filling in the gap and giving like a breather for your like brain mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. important too. Um, yeah, that's good advice. Thank you. Um, do you want to read? Let's see. We have, um, you have to go, you have nine minutes till you have to go to your class. Do you want to? Um, yeah. Yeah. How about I'll read one, uh, one sonnet from the drive-in movie sequence. Yeah, sure. I, I think that... we, have, we have time for more than one poem, but, but probably have well, time for two. Well, I'll, I'll read slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I, I love the cover of Temporary Kin. Anna Evans, who is a beautiful poet and publisher, worked with me um, to, to find this gorgeous photograph of a drive-in movie in Texas um, to go with these poems on um, work in a drive-in movie theater. So um, let me find the page. This is going to be page. I think I'll read um, Playground on page 14 okay. from my sequence of sonnets. Playground. 
was Eddie that kid's name? The monkey bar show off, the one who hogged each rung each time my sister tried to climb, or I? The car parked six rows back. Our dad had scouted prime location for best viewing of the screen. You girls go play. A twilight luxury. Pajamas in the sand. Not Halloween, but drive-in gear. Our mom okayed so we could swing and teeter, watch Ben-Hur, then sleep in backseat beds as night wore on and stars shone brighter. British submarines dove deep, James Bond strapped on a parachute, and cars like ours, perched quietly on little hills with poles and speakers, music swelling through those little holes. Excellent. That was Playground, one of the poems from a sequence in Temporary Kin. And you just hear the music of, um, I always call, you know, poetry is the music of speech, and the music comes out in your poems especially well. Um, Chris, Chris Herlinger asks uh, why the attraction to a series or set of poems with a defined theme which is something i noticed like your books all four of these books which we have here um which I'll, let me put on screen really quick just so we um okay. have time we have the we have temporary kin here and we have a, the a juror of course we have the, a, the typist play monopoly which is a, it's a glossy cover so it's hard to see in the glare um and then almost the rowboat so those are your four books and chat books um, and they do feel sort of theme oriented. So, so what is what's the attraction to a series or set of poems? Um, and, and you have themes within the book too. There are a lot of poetry sequences in each book as well. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm just thinking about temporary kin. Um, I tend to write. You know, we're talking about writing about work. I tend to write a lot of persona poems, um, inhabiting the persona of someone else. I just I find that just just delightful to do and and have ever since high school and college days and so so the you know if there's any theme to temporary kin it's it's just you know me writing a whole lot of persona poems um you know poems about people and kind of walking a mile in their shoes and um and, and so you know it's kind of a broad theme of just um the people that i'm temporarily inhabiting in a, in a poem so it, the, my, I hope my themes aren't like encrusted themes, mm -hmm. but just kind of broad themes that give me a lot of room to, to work within. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, like the typist play Monopoly has a sequence of poems based on women's self portraits over the centuries. And, you know, I was just really fascinated in, the you know the creating of these paintings and how women depicted ourselves over the centuries and um and so that was a wonderful um, just project to to kind of jump into and um i just love having that particular painting which is from the 15th century you know on the the cover of the typist play monopoly so you know, themes, I, again, I probably wouldn't write a book of poems about a rhinoceros as my theme, but, um, but, you know, to, to select something large enough that I have a lot of, um, a lot of room to, to dance around as a poet, um, that's, that's the attraction to constructing a book around a theme, that there's just a lot of, a lot of a lot of room. A lot of yeah, room. it seems to me like your books are kind of um, people watching. Like I remember, you know, yes, when I, back when yes. I had time in my life, there was a friend of mine who we just loved to go to the mall or whatever and have a coffee yes. and like watch the people and sort of comment yes. on the people and imagine yes. their lives. Yes. And yes. that's the yes. feeling that, that comes across in, in these books really yes. is, you know, yes. you're like people watching as a juror and you're people watching um, at a drive-in. Yes. It's kind of very people oriented. Definitely. And, you know, I was in, in uh, Manhattan visiting a friend years ago and I was on the subway and my friend said, quit staring at everybody. You don't stare at people on the subways in New York City. And I sort of went, oh, sorry. But, you know, I just find people so fascinating. I, I From then on, I tried not to stare at people, but I 
I do love people watching and eavesdropping yeah, and yeah. people are fascinating. It's, it I'm, I'm happy to be alive in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the subway, but you have to learn to like look out of the corner of your eye on the yes, subway. Yes, uh, yes. There's time for one last poem. Do you want to finish off with something? Mm, let's see. Wow. Um, gosh. I know there's Maybe. so many options. There are so many options. Um, let me read the title poem for the Typist Play Monopoly. Um, and this is this is a free verse poem. Oh. So um, I do occasionally write free verse. <laughs> See, when I well, every once in a while I would come across a poem that might have been free verse, and I I would just think like, what form is this that I'm not recognizing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So all you need to know is that when I was 12, my family moved. Um, from California to Colorado, and it was a long, lonely summer in which I played a lot of Monopoly with my mother, and I also learned how to type that summer. So, the typists play Monopoly. What page? Oh, there it is, 22. Okay. Page 22. Some afternoons, I am the thimble. We are new in this city, lulled by summer rain and rounding go and dice clacking in our loose fists. My mother rubs the hobo shoe, her talisman, tells me again of courteous men in hats knocking at the back door in 1935, some missing buttons, laces, teeth. Eager to accumulate, I take them in, her stories, pinch my green houses the size of a thumbnail, Broom my properties, Baltic Avenue, Mediterranean Avenue, Boardwalk, Park Place, slums and posh red hotels. You name it, I'm 12. Only ancestors die. Only encyclopedia cities burn or drown, melt in hot lava. Without fail, without fanfare, my mother amasses empires of her own, acquires the railroads, all four, a barefoot tycoon in pin curls. Magnanimous, too, with her typewriter, forgiving pads of paper, a psalm for my fingers, a chant. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Again and again, words spool out, some letters fainter, the P, the A. My desire, gigantic, speed, precision, vast neighborhoods on these alluring boards. I will know bankruptcies over time, but here, in these wet hours, a wash in five hundreds, goldenrod, I am the fox, alert, leaping. Thanks so much. That was Kathleen McClung reading the title poem from her book, The Typist Play Monopoly. And it's exactly 6.55, Kathleen, so we did perfectly. Um, I wish we had more time to chat, but, um, but it's been great Me talking too. to you. Thanks so much for being it's a guest been today. wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Thanks my pleasure. So it's always fun talking to poets. Um, great. And enjoy your class in a little bit. Get, take a little breather okay. first. <laughs> I will. All right. Thanks okay. for everyone for watching. All Bye. right. Good Bye -bye. night. Yes, yeah, so that was Kathleen McClung um, with her books. We have four books that she sent us. Um, I'll show them to you again before we go. And we also have the open mic coming up if you're new, so don't forget that. But um, here are four books. We have the Typist Play Monopoly, which came out from Barefoot Amuse Press, or no, from Kelsey Books, sorry. Wrong book. Um, so find that at Kelsey Books, um, the Typist Play Monopoly. Then of course, there's a, a juror must fold in on, on herself, which was the Rattle Chepik Prize winner with this fall issue. So if you're a subscriber to Rattle, you already have it. If not, um, a $25 subscription gets you the fall issue plus this, plus uh, three other issues and three other chat books. So go for that. Then we have Almost the Rowboat here. Almost the Rowboat from um, Finishing Line Press. And you can see it's got the um, hand-tied chat book thing going on. And then uh, her filling book, Tem uh, Temporary Kin. And that's the one by uh, Barefooted Muse and friend of the show, Anna Evans. Always good to see uh, Barefooted Muse Press 
doing books here. And you can find more um, of, of Kathleen McClung at her website, which is Kathleen mcclung.com that's kathleen like you'd expect and then mcclung is m-c-c-l-u-n-g.com so look up her website there and you'll find more of kathleen mcclung's work um now we're not done yet with the show and we still have the open lines i'm sorry i have to say goodbye to kathleen for a little bit and um the open lines are op- um uh, prompt based now and if you remember the prompt from last week was um, from Taylor Molly's Metaphor Dice. So so last week's guest was Taylor Molly. He has this stuff called Metaphor Dice, which is a teaching tool he uses. And what we rolled with the Metaphor Dice was hope is a vacant curse. So if you watched last week's episode and you found Taylor Taylor Molly in the prompt here um, and you wrote a poem, hope is a vacant curse, um, all you have to do is email it to me if you haven't yet at openmike at rattle.com. Then uh, either send me a chat message over Skype. Skype's preferred because then we can see you, which is nice. Um, send me a chat message um, at Rattle Poetry, all one word. I will uh, see you there and call you back when the time is right. Um, and if you only have a phone, that's totally fine too. The phone number is 818-850-7727. Let it ring a few times and I will call you back when it's your turn. I just go in order. We have some people calling in here. Carla Schwartz is calling in. Joyce Stahl, Kathy Gibbons, Sally Dunn, Richard Westheimer. Um, so we got some people lined up. Um, but remember to send your poem to openmicatreddle.com first so I can show it on screen and everybody can read along. Um, now, my poem was written moments before the show, as always. I like the first stanza. And the second stanza, I was kind of going back and forth. Um, so this is Hope is a Vacant Curse. And... Um, Here's my poem. Now, this is Cain and Abel. And then this is a syllabic poem with seven syllables each line because there's seven days of the week. And then five, I'm, I'm going to call this a, um, a fistina, I think. Um, so, so hope is a vacant curse, runs down one side, and then curse vacant uh, is hope. It runs backwards on the other side like that. And this is Cain and Abel. I was just, really, the form completely... Um, um, made this poem because I was just thinking, how could I make a form like this? And then this came to me. So Cain and Abel, um, hope is a vacant curse was a theme. Hope was never lost on Cain. Is the fruit of my own hand a kind of joke to you, my vacant father? He cried. His curse became the sacrifice. His sacrifice was the curse of the earth growing vacant, the house without a father, a gift. And the other truth is, Abel never lost his hope. So that's a pretty, that might be the most intricate poem I've ever written. That's kind of, I don't know, it took like a much longer than it should have to write that. (laughs) Okay, and then here's Megan's poem. Now, most of the prompts, except for when we use Taylor Molly, the prompts are usually Megan's prompts. And um, so this is the first time she's been forced to write a prompt that was not her own. (laughs) And this is Hope is a Vacant Curse, another great poem from Megan. Here we go. Hope is a vacant curse. A gutted motel room, little left but bits of wire, expired coffee packets, a moth circling a naked, flickering bulb. Better, surely, to sleep in a cave or beneath a tree, where the air smells of cedar and all the wild things are new. But we are drawn to four walls and a roof, So we make roommates of cigarette ashes and ghosts of euthanized dreams, telling ourselves it's better than nothing, like the moth tells herself she's kissing the sun. All the night, the rain leaks through, and the animal inside us slaps it up. That was Megan's poem, For Hope is a Vacant Curse. Um, You know, Megan is, is a much better poet than me, so that's how it goes. That's why I married her. Um, let's, well, that's not the only reason. Um, let's see what you have now. Um, let us call up the first person who asked, and that is Richard Westheimer. Let's call up Richard. And I have to log in and find the poems first. So hang on just a second. I forgot to do that before the show started. So the phone's ringing. 
Richard usually answers pretty quick. I'm not sure where he is. Let's see. Hmm. Well, he's not answering. I'll call Richard back in just a little bit. One thing I should let you know, too, I keep forgetting to remind people, is just that the, I'm calling from the future. There's like a 30-second delay as the, um, the, the, the stream bounces around the series of tubes that is the Internet. And um, so I won't be able to call you back right away. So Richard's right here, but I'll, I'll do... Um, well, Richard says not sure what happened. I'll call him Richard again. Let's do Richard. We have his poem here, Hopeful Hats. It says Richard is unavailable. Hmm. Um, yeah, so Richard, try to call me, maybe. Let's see. I'm going to let Richard try to call me. I don't know what's going on. It, it, it didn't connect, but maybe he can try to call me. Well, wait a second. Um, Richard's a regular guest. It's always nice to have him on the show. Um, and I'll just remind you one more time as we're waiting, and hopefully Richard will try to call me. Here he comes. Hey, Richard, can you hear me? I sure can. Can you see me okay? I can't. Yeah, I think you have to click on the camera still. Huh. Hmm. But your voice yeah. sounds great, so maybe okay. uh, we'll just do it by voice. Okay. Um, so your poem, your poem was Hopeful Hats. Is there anything you want to say about it before we start? Well, you'll see when I get to the hope is a thankful uh, or a vacant curse that I cheated a little bit. <laughs> okay, uh, but it was a great it was a great prompt. I loved I loved the dice. I've shared the, the that little snippet from the uh, interview with a number of teacher friends of mine, and uh, um, I might get a set myself. That's great. Yeah, I, my opinion of prompts is that any prompt that works that makes a poem works so it doesn't have to have to stick to the form i don't care as long as um and i trust everybody that you're actually writing about the prompt so so go ahead with uh, hopeful yeah hats. We'll, give, we'll give it a shot yeah okay. go ahead hopeful hats i wear the one that says her name that shows my wokeness betrays a small hope that we can all get along my neighbor wears the red one, the one that makes America greater than he feels at work when he dons his Pizza Hut hat, which says, have an everything on it day. My daughter's hat she wore when marching with a million women has pink pussy ears. It says, make my day patriarchy, do your worst, which of course it does. And we all know any day that has everything on it is a scourge. And an America as great again as it was makes us all murderers. And as often as I say her name, she is as dead as she was and will die again in the body of another black woman and another. Each of these hopeful hats is a vacant curse unless we all swear to rip the words off the brims, the clothes off our backs, and swim in the same sea until we all know we are the water. Well, that's a great poem, Richard. Yeah, yeah, that was, it was kind of fun beginning thing. It's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks. I hope the cheating didn't like disqualify <laughs> me from future. No, there, there's no qualification. Like I was saying, um, you know, wherever it takes you, take let the prompt take you where it wants to take you. Follow the poem. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Let's see. Uh, who is next? We have, that was Richard uh, Westheimer with a great poem, Hopeful Hats. Thanks for sharing that, Richard. Um, let's see. We have Sally Dunn. Let's call up Sally. I'll find Sally's poem as it's ringing. This is just the regular telephone, but I see Sally's poem here. One thing I should say, which Sally did, thanks, Sally, is to include it as an attachment. Um and Sally, hey, how you doing? Good, how you doing? I'm good. Um, yeah, great. So so your poem was Hope Laughed When She Jumped from Pandora's Box. Is there anything you want to say about it before you start? Um, just that it's still pretty rough draft. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, Hope laughed when she jumped from Pandora's box. Hope was a vacant cor curse when out in public. The curse that is no curse, hope tells your friends over dinner and wine that life is forever easy and friends always true. At, hope, hopes, at home, hope smiles 
as you wish your friends will not desert you. You will save your husband, your brother, your mother. You will age with ease and grace. She laughs and flashes her sign, empty, absent, not responding. Hope loves to lure, hope, hope loves to throw out lures, reel in her devotees, and watch them flop and flail on barren lands as the depths of hope's deceptions come clear. Hope is a vacant promise, a curse complete. Oh, that's excellent. Sally Dunn, thanks so much for sharing that. Hope laughed when she jumped from Pandora's box. A great poem. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love personifying hope there. That was cool. Good idea. Once you jumped off into went out in public, I knew it was going to be good. Thanks for sharing that, Sally. (laughs) Thank you. Good night. Good night. Um, Let's see. So Gail Hammond just called. um, But next up we have Kathy Gibbons. Let's call Kathy. I think everybody's on the phone right now, which is, oh, Carl is too. Okay. Let's call up Kathy Gibbons. I'll find Kathy's poem. Hi, Tim. Hey, Kathy. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well, thank you. And thank you for a wonderful program this evening. My yeah. pleasure. This was a good, it's sort of a, a nice, tight one. Like, there was no glitches, and, and Kathleen was interesting, and then she had to go. There was no, like... Should I extend the show longer or not? It was kind of a nice, clean one. Very, very fun to see. It was. was. Um, do you do you want to say anything about your poem before you read it? Uh, well, I just found the uh, vacant curse to be a little bit of a contradiction in terms, and I hope that hope comes through as a constant. So, other than that, okay, <laughs> well, okay, sounds go good. Go ahead Let, and go. Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> okay, it's called "Invisible Witch." No eye of newt. Hope is a vacant curse, an eager flower, an empty purse, a tailless lizard gamely climbing up a blade of spider lily. Keep on plowing, keep on trucking, sensibility, like two negatives equal positivity. A vacant curse contains no curse at all. An empty salvo shot into infinity who laughs back like baby flowers sucking on the sun and bending to their burden, ignoring such great weight that awaits us, everyone, beckoning to reckon with each decorated, filigreed moment still to come. Excellent. That was Kathy Gibbons with her prompt poem, Invisible Witch, No Eye of Newt. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kathy. Another great one. This is a, this is a good prompt to turn out. Yeah, it was fun to work with. Thanks a lot, Tim, for everything. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, Who is next? Do we have... uh, Let's call up Joy Stahl. I know I have Joy's poem here. I saw it just a second ago. Hello. Hey, Joy. How are you doing tonight? All right. Um, is there anything you want to say about your poem before you read it? Um, just that uh, I was, I almost just wrote uh, Hope is a Vacant Curse, which is to say I will write this poem. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead and read it whenever you're ready. All right. Hope is a Vacant Curse, which is to say writing poetry is both easy and difficult impossible and imperative never finished and almost begun excellent that you know i hadn't thought of that but yeah a poem every poem is kind of a vacant curse isn't it Mm-hmm. or the um, hope of getting it finished in this anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah well thanks so much for sharing that um uh, that once again that was joy style thanks joy thank you good night okay that was a fun one let's uh who's next carla schwartz has a poem here for us let me find, uh, let me call up Carla. And I saw, here it is. Hello, hello. Hey, Carla, how are you doing tonight? I am good, I'm good. I just put you on mute, I mean the other part. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, and how's the, like, move going or something? You, you mentioned you were you were busy doing something. 
Oh, yes. Well, I was emptying a house and um, and uh, trying to get it ready to sell. And oh, it right. looks like that's going to happen. So that's good. Excellent. Yeah, it's a weird I can't believe it's like a good time to sell a house. But apparently it is like our house value. I was looking at Zillow and, and yep. I was tempted. <laughs> yes, yes. It's and, and it's a tricky thing because, you know, something with the election and something else, things might collapse the other way or you know, so this is the time. Yeah, right now. yeah. So. I hate to admit it, but that's exactly what I was saying. Like, you have like one month to sell a house, and then you probably are stuck wherever <laughs> wherever you are. Um, anyway, about the poem, is there anything you want to say about it before you read it? Yeah. So uh, I had missed last week, you know, doing the um, persona poem from the perspective of the animal, mm -hmm. and so I actually combined the two. Oh, of it's the, like a, an yeah. overachiever with some bonus points, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it was there are two things. I, I keep a blog and I send out my blog. I send it out to really my friends. And um, um, and I have a lot of pictures that I took of this mouse that was living in the grill, our grill, uh -huh. and, and nested there and had babies. Oh, wow. And um, then one of my friends, you know, sent me a note and said, like, like, how did the mother know or think, how could she possibly think a grill was a safe place to keep the babies? Okay. So it kind <laughs> yeah. of inspired this Interesting. poem. So this is called From the Mouse Nesting in Our Grill. Awesome. Let's hear it. You know the grill. It's the vacant bed of iron flats blackened with years long use caked in rancid fat drippings from bygone steaks but unused through this birth cycle or last, and here, resting on the slats, tools bagged for future use, stored in plastic, oh, plastic, I can rip with claw, with jaw, to form a perfect mattress. Oh, let me gather now for the nest, knots of hair discarded at the shower, bits of grass, and crisp brown oak leaves for cover. For even as we rest here in darkness on our bed, my silent hope for our coming brood, those others, the, one, the big ones with their hands approach to lift the lid, expose us to the light of day, our loves turned panicked escape as we scramble down to the safety of the drip pan and still our seeds compete. Our babies, eight pups, in all come curled and pink, nursing at my teeth until once more exposed to blinding day, the hands of man unmask the curse that is our nest, the curse of vacant hope. Excellent poem. And that was Carla Schwartz with From the Mouse Nesting in Our Grill. Thanks so much, Carla. That was another excellent poem. These are great poems today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. And and Carla is uh, CB99 videos. So if you um, if you want to follow her on YouTube or Instagram or anywhere, just look up CB Bees and Boy 99 videos. That's her. Um, let's see. I think we only have, we have one more person. Let me remind you once one more time, just in case anybody uh, wants to get in before we get to uh, Gail Hemmen. Uh, all you have to do is send a first email the poem to open mic at rattle dot com. Then. Uh, you can have two options, either phone call me at 818-850-7727, let it ring a few times, and I'll call you back. Um, or you can send a chat message to Rattle Poetry at Skype. Just say, hey, and I will uh, say, hey, I want to read a poem, and I will call you back when the time is right. Um, so there's two ways to call in. Let me make sure if I only have uh, one poet left. I think I think Gail Hemmen is probably the last one unless anybody – oh, we have an incoming call. We have a 613 number calling, so we'll do that after Gail. But let's call up Gail right now. Hi, good evening. Hey, Gail, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm uh, doing pretty well, Tim. Thanks. How are you tonight? I'm doing good. Do you want to turn on your camera or not? <clears throat> um, sure. Well um yeah it's nice to nice to see everybody it is yeah uh, hi there, good evening. there you go yeah hey 
Yeah, good to see you. So is there anything you want to say about your poem? After my dad's heart attack, I wash dishes? Um, just just that I definitely have been uh, been inspired by the recent poets on here. I know last week um, definitely was grappling with, uh, you know, writing through through ver through loss and the way that verse and and form the last couple of poets um, <clears throat> have given us some real real insight into how this can be a powerful container. And I see them and and the poets here at Rattlecast using it. So honored to use it tonight. Um, awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. Let, go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, th thank you, Tim. So roll rolling the dice toward hope here. <laughs> um, after my dad's heart attack, I washed dishes. As I washed my dishes in dishwater hot, I thought of my neighbor older down the block, missing the warmth of a girlfriend's warm talk and taking her hand as we'd take a walk. I couldn't name it, though I study language. Warmth in my belly, I thought I had managed. She'd offered me lunch when my life in rubble. Now I don't give her any trouble, but space, a bubble. I would lose my parents, so why lose double? Now as this vision sprang up through the bubbles, time stopped, washed bowl broke, clean in my hands. In the sink in pieces, my childhood stands. The pieces reflecting a new bowl to make. I put it together as my hands shake. The warmth of hands in insisting give and make. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to read tonight. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. How's your dad doing? Is he okay? Uh, he is okay. As a, a few months back now, he's doing mm -hmm. great. I went to, just finished harvesting the fall garden, and uh, you know, he's he's great. He's in good spirits, and um, actually been writing some letter poems to him. And and life uh, life moves forward. Full tumble here. So thank Excellent. you. Thanks so much. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That was Gail Hammond. Um, have a good night, Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Bye. Yeah, so glad to hear that uh, Gail's dad's doing okay. That was a powerful poem. Um, now we have one last poet to call, I think. And this is a 613 number, someone who's never called in before. Let's see who it is. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share a poem? Um. Yes, actually, if I could sneak in a, a second one, I had the day wrong yesterday. Oh, okay. <laughs> so who am I talking to, first of all, though? Sorry, this is Tamara from Canada. Ah, Tamara, good to hear you. Let's, uh, Tamara Best. Um, Correct. And you have a poem, Why Brother? Um, uh, yeah. Father. Uh, is there anything you want to say about it before you read it? Um that it is actually for my poetry teacher um, from back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, for loot. Great. Well, why don't you go ahead and read it, and we'll, I'll put it on screen for everybody. Why bother? I can answer this one, see, thanks to grade 12 poetry. A funny phrase that's worth repeating, perhaps sarcastic, but not misleading. I keep it safely written down. Its feature is a made-up noun. And because I like philosophy, I think it fitting, a phrase for me. I don't need a fancy verse. To argue hope is not a curse. If that were true, then forget intention, making plans or invention. Sometimes stupid, sometimes wrong, but never vacant, or we'd all be gone. Defy the skeptics. They're the worst. I point my finger at them first. It's to them that I retort. Yes, helplessly is a sport. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. It was Tamara Best with Why Bother? And uh, I love the rhymes and the way you weave those through. Thanks for sharing that, Tamara. <laughs> um, honestly, I rarely ever write rhyming poems. Mm -hmm. And I set out with the intention of not rhyming at all, and it just, well, anyway. Uh, can I read another one very quickly? Uh, sure. Do you have something else? I think that's all you, all you said, though. Uh, but go mm -hmm. ahead. Go read something else. Sure. We have, yeah, we have it wouldn't be on the screen. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, this is more what I had in mind. Okay. The last laugh. Curious, no longer, sits on the lid and waits for Zeus to have his fun. Ha, ha, ha. Less that she wants him to stop, but that she knows eventually 
he'll get bored and wander away into the room now full of distractions. Zip, bang, pow, and go and start go pestering the humans again. Gods almighty, they think it was all an accident. Worse, they're still trying to clean up the mess. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that, Tamara. Okay. Good night, Tim. Good night. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. You're welcome. Right. Okay, so um so Vicky Miko's not here, but but she has a like a haikuish poem. And um, I think she might like me to share it. So I'm just going to go ahead and share this. This is Hope is a Vacant Curse. It's Vicky Miko's poem. Um, let me get it over on screen here. Hope is a vacant curse. A boy claws through the ruins of deep ashes. And then she has this picture. It's a, um, is it, is it a, a haiga, which is where haiku is combined with an actual picture. This is, looks like a picture of some kind of fence post um, in a forest fire. A boy claws through the ruins of deep ashes. Excellent haiku. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was Vicky Miko uh, sharing her poem. Um, let me see if there's anybody else who probably wanted to share. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's it for tonight. So thanks, everybody, for joining me. Um, let's see. Yeah, so tomorrow, or not tomorrow, what am I talking about? Next week's um, prompt is going to be, this is another Megan-generated prompt after the little, the little Taylor Molly interlude. Uh, Megan's prompt here is going to be, write a poem with a color as the title. A very simple prompt for next week. Write a poem with the color as a title. That is next week's prompt, so I hope you can join me. Write something. I'll write something too, so will Megan. We'll have a lot of fun with that, and um, we'll see you then. Now, next week's guest is going to be, oh, Molly Fisk. Uh, her book, California, uh, Fire and Water, A Climate Crisis Anthology. She says an anthology of poems about um, the fires going on in California. So a good segue with uh, Vicky Miko's haiku there. Uh, we'll be talking to Molly Fisk, probably looking at some other poems of hers. It's Rattlecast number 61, uh, Tuesday, October 6th, same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, once again, next week's prompt is going to be uh, write a poem with a color as the title. So looking forward to seeing you then, and I will talk to you soon. Have a good night.